And I had talked about the, uh, what God's plan is for, uh, for the, the family. <clears throat> I talked about the fact that, that, uh, that God hates divorce. God doesn't want divorce. I, I talked about the fact that God doesn't want us to be involved in pornography and that God doesn't, uh, that out west in, uh, in Utah and in Nevada, we're influenced by a guy named uh, Warren Jeffs. He is the uh, leader of the um, restored uh, Latter-day Saints Church, which uh, believes in polygamy. And uh, you can go to a place called Colorado City, Utah, and you can find these great big houses that are unfinished because they've got several wives and children that live there. And he's, uh, he's the, the leader of that, but believes in polygamy, believes that, that that's okay. And I, I was talking about the fact that God hates all that. God hates the putting away. God hates pornography. God hates perversion. God hates promiscuity. A guy came up to me and he said, he said, listen, I might as well leave the conference. He said, I've been involved in all that stuff. He said, what do I, what do, I do? What, 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 uh, where, where does that put me? I mean, uh, I'm married to my third wife right now. He said, do I leave my first wife and go back to my, to my uh, first wife? What do, I, what do I do about that? And uh, I, was, I was really glad he did that. And uh, uh, because the fact of the matter is, God doesn't ask you to retrace your steps. God doesn't ask you to go back. Now, if you've offended somebody, the Bible says, you go to that person one-on-one -on -one and you ask for forgiveness for offending that person. That's what you do. But God doesn't say to you, all right, you've blown it up to this point, so you're no good, you're useless, get out of here, you're, you're no good. God always tell, takes us where we are. And God tells us what to do right now where we, where we are. I, I, I can't go back to when I was 10 years old or 15 years old or, or 20 years old. If I've offended somebody and, and I never got it right, I, I can go back and ask for forgiveness. But I can't be that 20-year-old again. I can't be the 35-year-old that divorced my, my spouse. I can't be that but I can be what God wants me to be right now. And how do I do that? Well, there are three steps. Number one, I confess, the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive me my sin and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So whatever I've blown in the past, I can be honest with God and say, God, I blew this, please forgive me, I was wrong. And, and, and I, I confess, I admit to you it was wrong. Uh, somebody would say, well, I got divorced and my wife was horrible. Or, or, or you might say, I got divorced because my husband was horrible and was terrible. Well, again, it's very important that we understand if you, if you got a divorce, <clears throat> God, Jesus says it's very plain and we can try and refigure it. But here's what Jesus said, divorce is just legalized adultery. Uh, that's basically what Jesus says in, in Matthew chapter 19. They say, they say hey, Moses said we could divorce our wives for any cause. He said, yeah, he did. He, no, he didn't. He allowed for divorce. He said in, in Deuteronomy chapter 24, God allowed for divorce because of the hardness of your hearts. But adultery, biblical, a, a biblical definition for adultery is very simply this. It's breaking the marriage vows. There's one word. Uh, there's one word that describes any type of sexual sin, and that's the word fornication. That describes anything from bestiality to homosexuality to lesbianism to whatever, and that would include divorce because it's breaking the marriage vows. The word adultery means to break the marriage vows, and you can do that legally or illegally uh, according to the, the book of Deuteronomy. So Jesus said, Moses allowed it because of the hardness of your heart. From, uh, from the beginning it was not so. God hates divorce. It's not a good thing. And so, so what I have to do is if, I, if, I was, if I've been divorced in the past, I say, I say, God, forgive me where I was wrong. You see, in a, in a divorce situation, uh, there's always two people involved. And you say, well, is it, and it, well the majority of it was my, spouse's, was my spouse's problem. Maybe 80% was their problem. 20% was yours. Maybe 95% was their problem and 5% was your problem then you need to understand that you have to answer 100%. You are 100% responsible for your 5%. And you have to confess that 5% to God. So if I confess my sin to God, He's faithful and just to forgive me my sins. And listen to this, this word, and to cleanse me. 
It's not like I'm partially, like I'm a second class citizen. I'm totally cleansed. I'm totally and completely clean. I'm, I don't have to, I'm, I'm guilt free. Christ has taken all my guilt, all my shame, everything that I've done. It's all, it's all beyond me. So the first thing I do is I, I understand this is God's program. I don't have to live in regret for everything I've done in the past. I confess my sin and I'm right with God. I'm clean. I'm clean. I'm pure. Number two, the Bible says in, in Proverbs chapter 28, 13, it says, uh, he that covereth his sin, if I say that, hey, I didn't do anything wrong, shall, shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh. So the second thing I need to do is forsake and then I'll have God's mercy that'll help me to do the right thing from this point on. <coughs> God, I have a, a pattern of doing the wrong things. You know I have the pat a pattern of doing the wrong things. And what am I going to do? C confess it, say that it was wrong, and uh, I'm going to forsake it. I am going to give this up. I'm not going to do this anymore. Uh, that, that's what you have to do with pornography. That's what you have to do with promiscuity. That's what you have to do with all those things. I'm going to confess. Now, there's things that you have to battle with. Every time you get involved in sin, there's consequences for sin. There's, there's big consequences and there's little consequences, but there's consequences for sin. So you have to battle with that. That doesn't mean you're not clean in the sight of God and you're not forgiven. And you can have mercy and say, God, in your mercy, would you please help me to overcome this thing? And God will help you to overcome the sin. The third thing you need to do is remember that you're always going to be under attack. Won't there be a time where I'm not tempted to do this anymore? No. If you are a perpetual liar and then you got saved, you're going to have a problem. You're going to, have, you're going to be tempted to, keep lie, to lie about things. You're going, to, you're going to have that temptation because that's the pattern of your life. But if you confess it and you say, I'm going to forsake it, then you'll have His mercy, and then you got to remember you're going to be constantly under attack in those areas. And so God, help me uh, day by day to live uh, your way. And, and then uh, the, uh, the Bible says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth, think he lets he fall. Well, if you get to a point you say, oh, I'll never have a problem with that again. Yep, you're going to have a problem with it. Uh, you know, I'm never going to have a problem with lust anymore. And, and you'll dream something that you, you wish you wouldn't have dreamed. Uh, you, you're going to, the, you're going to have problems. Why? <clears throat> Here's why. He says, let, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. You need to understand it's common to be tempted. But God, who is, uh, God, but God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are, which you are able, but he will with the temptation also make a way of escape. So you need to be able to and say, Lord, give me that way of escape. It might be, as I said, I think last night, uh, an accountability partner, but you can. You can get in on God's plan. Confess, forsake, and remember you're going to always be under attack. And then just day by day deal with that. Day by day surrender to the Holy Spirit of God. Now, once you do that, <clears throat> we're talking about balancing family and ministry. How do you do that? So many times I have talked to young people who say that, or, or they're now adults, say that my parents were involved in ministry and they never had time for us. They were too busy in the ministry. In fact, I grew up at a time where people were, te were, were preachers, well-known preachers, were saying, uh, you need to burn out for Jesus. Go out and just burn out for Jesus. Just do it all and go and go and go. <clears throat> Excuse me. You need to go and go. And just, uh, boy, wasn't that food good? I think we should give an applause to somebody who made all that food. That was just amazing. <laughs> that was great. Anyway, uh, I keep enjoying that food. It's this guy. And, and so um, uh, what, what I want to do, uh, or the, I, I, again, I was brought up hearing, hearing just burn out for Jesus and God will take care of your family. That never works. God made you responsible for your family, and you've got to take that responsibility. And so <clears throat> we just determined years ago, our children are going to be involved in everything we do in ministry, and that we enjoyed ministry together. That's one thing I love about your pastor. Your pastor and his wife enjoy ministry together, and their children are all involved. Man, you're such a talented pastor. I mean, last night, I'm looking up there. In fact, I asked your pastor if, if he would come out and do our missions conference 
but he, he's, uh, but he can only come if he brings his whole family with him. And uh, because just, I loved, I loved listening to him. I love, I love watching him interact. I love the fact that they pour so much into their family. So, so I think it's so important. We did that. We just said, uh, if we can't, if we can't have the right, uh, uh, if, we don't, if we don't raise our children right, then we don't really have a ministry. We have nothing to say to anybody else. And so that's what we determined to do. So <clears throat> let me give you some thoughts. <clears throat> Work God's plan. Work God's plan. What, what does that mean? I mean, in Philippians chapter 3, I'm going to read this to you. <clears throat> the Bible says this. Verses 1 through 5 says this. If there, if there be any consolation in Christ any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Don't do anything to lift yourself up or because you're mad at somebody. But in lowliness of mind, thank you, uh, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. In verse 13 it says, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. This passage, I just read the absolute wrong passage. That talked about the Lord and the Lord giving Himself totally and completely for us. I meant to read Philippians chapter 3 and verse 1 through 5 where, where Paul talks about setting goals. And he says, finally my brethren rejoice in the Lord. Verse 13 says this, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before, I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling. Paul was somebody who set goals in his life to accomplish what God wanted him to be. His number one goal, as we just read in, in Philippians, was to be like Christ, to think like Christ, to be a servant like Christ, to do what God wanted him to do. My, when my, I met my wife in in October of 1973. In fact, in September of 1973, went to Bible college. I went there to study for the ministry and I said, Lord, I'm coming to college. <clears throat> I'm going to come here and serve you. And so for the next four years, I'm not even going to look at a girl. I'm not going to talk to a girl. I'm just going to be like a monk in a monastery. I'm going to focus on you, Jesus. I'm going to love you, Jesus. I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to study. I'm going to listen to my professors. That's what I'm going to do for the next four years. Not even going to look at a girl. I said that in September. In October, I met Anna. <laughs> and, uh, and in October, <clears throat> we, I, I, every place I went, she showed up. I mean, she was there. She was just there. She was uh, uh, all around. And I thought, man. And she kept talking about Jesus, and she loved Jesus, and she wanted to serve Jesus. And I thought, man, that's the kind of girl I want to marry, but I can't talk to her for four years. And, uh, and, and the, the, the more I was with her, the more I talked to her, the more I saw her, I went, I went home. I went to my dorm, and my roommate's name was Wayne Brown. I said, Wayne. I said, I met this girl named Annie. He said, yeah. I said, I, I talked to, excuse me, I talked to her. Uh, all the time. And I said, she just loves the Lord. She wants to serve the Lord. I said, but I told the Lord I wasn't going to talk to a girl or date a girl for four years. I was just going to focus on him. He said, that's good. I said, why? He said, because I want to date her. So I determined that that was God's plan for me to just go after Anna. And so, uh, so uh, anyway, we got together. We started, we, when we met, we started talking about what we were going to do in the future. We started making plans. We talked about family plans. We talked about, about um, what we wanted to do. I shared with her I wanted to go back out to Las Vegas. I wanted to start a church. I wanted to have a family. I wanted to have a real family. Since I, didn't, since I had a, since I had a so somewhat dysfunctional family, I wanted to have a, a dad and a mom and children, and I wanted to, I, that's what I wanted to talk to. We talked about what was important. We talked about what was important to her, what was important to me. We talked about our goals. We talked about getting married. We talked about having a family. We, start, we talked about starting a church. We talked about reaching Las Vegas with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was our goal. People say, how, how did all this happen? We 
we've helped start 11 churches in Las Vegas. We've sent, I can't tell you how many millions of dollars to missionaries around the world. We've, we've, seen, uh, we've seen literally thousands of people trust Christ and God's allowed us to affect just, I, I really do not know the effect that our family is having in, 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 in ministry. I, it's all totally and completely by the mercy and grace of God. But it started off with us making plans. This is what we were going to do and, and setting goals. We, we've seen a lot accomplished because we sat down and, and set some goals. So let me share with you some goals that you ought to set, some things you ought to do. Number one, set time management goals. Set time management goals. When we moved to Las Vegas, my wife and I went out to the desert and we sat down, uh, actually right in Lake Mead, we were overlooking Lake Mead, we were sitting where some cliffs were and we we're looking out of Lake Mead. And I said, we just have to decide uh, what our schedule is going to be. And so we decided together, didn't matter what anybody else said, we were going to take Mondays off, that every year, no matter what anybody said, we were going to take a two-week family vacation every year. That's what we were going to do. We decided we were going to take Tuesday through Thursday, that I was going to study in the morning, and Tuesday through Friday, we were going to knock on doors in the afternoon. That's what we did. That's what we did. We'd set the schedule and said this is what we were going to do. We said Tuesday night we were going to go on visitation. Wednesday night we were going to do church. Thursday night we were going to do discipleship groups. Friday night we were going to do youth activities because there was nobody to do youth activities and we wanted youth activities. We were young. We were 22 years old. And so we had all this energy to do whatever. If I tried to do this schedule right now, I'd have to shoot myself. Um, but, uh, but that's what we decided we were going to do. We decided all day Saturday that was going to be our visitation time. We were going to go out uh, revisiting people that we had visited throughout the week. And then Sunday there was going to be church all day. I, by nature, am a workaholic. By nature, I just, I just do. I just, I, number one, I like doing what I'm doing. I like pastoring. I like visiting people. I like talking to people. I, 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 what I do, I love doing. My uncle told me years ago he was a photographer. He said, he said, when I was in the Army, I decided that I didn't want to work all my life. So he said, I found out what I really like to do. I like to take pictures. And he said, now I go to work and I play all day long. He said, I, that's, he said David, and he said this to me when I was about 14 years old. He said, find something you like to do and do it the rest of your life, and you'll enjoy your life instead of just enduring life. Well, I like ministering. I love doing that. And, and I am goal-oriented. And so if I don't set times aside for, 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 for my priorities, then I won't, I won't meet those priorities. I'll be busy doing something all the time. So when we set, we set a, a, a weekly and daily schedule, we scheduled, uh, we scheduled our time by our priorities. And that's, that's important too. So set time management goals and then and then schedule your time management goals based on your priorities. So my time management goals are based on, number one, the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to schedule time for God every day, whenever that's going to be. Some people are morning people. I'm a, I'm, I, am by, I now am a morning person. So I set time for God. I set time with my wife. Where and when is that going to be? When, where and when am I going to spend time with my wife? I had a lady say to me one time, she said, if, 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 I was, if I was married to you and you said you had to schedule time uh, with me, I wouldn't ever want to be with you. And I thought, that's good because I wouldn't want to be with you either. But the fact of the matter is, uh, if, you're gonna, if, you, if something's important to you and you're a busy person, you have to schedule that time. And so I schedule time. My, my son Joshua just uh, called, had his secretary call me and said to me, hey, he pastors a church that's a little larger than our church right now. And... Um, he called me and he said, uh, he said, um, Dad, or his secretary called me and said, I want to make sure I schedule uh, three, ta three times a month with you because I don't want to lose this time with you. And so I'm scheduling three times. And I, and I said, I'm insulted that you just called me and wanted to schedule three, three times a month with me. No, that's, that's exactly what busy people do that, that love you. If they love you, they're going to schedule time with you if they want to be with you. That's the only way you can do it. So spend, schedule time with God, your wife, your children. When and where are you going to be with them? With others then. When and where are you going to be with them? Uh, if you don't put those important people in your, in your slot, you'll ignore the important ones because you'll think, you'll think, 
Oh, I can get together with them anytime. Oh, I can get together. Oh, I can get together with them anytime. And people will think the same thing. What you live with your family. You live with your family. My son Matthew is the um, uh, is the executive pastor of our church. We have an office right next to each other. People think that me and Matthew interact all the time because we're in an office right next to each other, and we're father and son. I. We can go like weeks without talking to each other because he's busy doing what he's doing and I'm busy doing what I'm doing. So we have to schedule times. I have a friend whose son moved from Florida to Texas and uh, he, he, I said, how do you keep in contact? He said, I schedule, da daily, I, I schedule weekly devotional times. He's still a single man. I schedule uh, uh, weekly devotional times with him and we call every Thursday and we talk. I thought that's a very wise thing to do. If you don't do those things, those important relationships diminish and so don't let that happen. Schedule time with your children. When are you going to, when are you going to spend time with your children? Don't just spend spiritual time with your children. Schedule fun, fun times with your children. And I'll talk about that more tomorrow. And then number three, set standards for life. When Anna and I, Anna came from the Northeast, she came from up here. In, well, this is, I don't know what you consider yourself, Midwest, but anything in Nevada uh, east of Utah is east for us. So uh, anyway, uh, uh, but she grew up in, in western Pennsylvania. She had a whole set of different standards than I came, than I grew up with in the southwest, which was no standards at all for anything. I had nothing to do. In fact, my mind was really blown. I left Las Vegas, Nevada where we did whatever we wanted to do. And then I went to Lynchburg, Virginia, where nobody does anything. Uh, and uh, and, and I mean, you don't do anything. The only thing Baptists do in Virginia is eat. That's it. You don't, you don't do anything. You don't, I, didn't, I never heard of, of things like no mixed swimming. I never knew. I, in fact, I did not know what they were talking about. They said, oh, well, we don't have mixed swimming here in, uh, in Virginia. I said, oh, what? wow. And I got to thinking, who, who, who mixes with what? I had no idea. Then I thought, oh man, if this is the South. Maybe black people and white people don't swim together. Oh, That's what I thought. I had no idea. <laughs> and I thought, man, there are prejudice around here. <laughs> then I found out they were talking about girls and boys. And I thought, oh, oh. And then I found out that guys and girls weren't allowed to hold hands. And they, this is all new stuff to me, and they're not allowed to kiss. I thought, what do you do with a girl uh, if you don't hold hands and kiss? What do you do? I, I had no concept at all, and I had to be totally retrained. So, but my, my wife grew up, again, I, in western Pennsylvania. She was next to the Amish, and then she had, so we had, we had totally different standards. Uh, she had a lot, and I had little, and uh, we had to decide what our standards were. So we met together. We talked about that. We decided what our standards were for dress, what our, what our standards were going, where we were going to live. And by the way, we travel all over the country, and you may not understand this or may not believe this, but there's Christians that dress a whole lot of different ways in all different parts of the country, and some things are acceptable some places, and some things are not acceptable other places. And when you're traveling, uh, you have to understand that, that um, and you have to be well, willing to adapt to that. So you have to decide what your standards are for dress, and you have to decide if you're going to be ministering to a, a lot of different people. Paul said, I've become all things to all men, that by all means I might save some. That's not being hypocritical. That's being discretionary and understanding that some people uh, have different backgrounds than you do, and, and you need to respect those backgrounds. So you then you have to decide where you're going to live. You have to decide what you are going to participate in as a family and what you're not going to participate in a family. Are you going to watch TV or are you not going to watch TV? Are you going to go to movies or are you not going to go to movies? Are you going to, are, are you, if there's social events, are, are, are you going to go to it? Are you, are, you going to, are you allowed to go to the circus or are you not going to go to the circus? I have friend, a friend that would never ever watch a movie but, uh, uh, but, but they, they would go to a circus and watch girls on a trans, tra uh, trapeze that that wear very little of anything, and, but that was okay, but the movies were not okay. That's okay, that's, that's, their, that's their preference, and I, I have no problem with that, but you have to decide, hey, what is and what isn't acceptable. Uh, when you pray, um, 
uh, or, or I'm sorry, you have to decide those things. What is and what is not proper entertainment for your family? If you, if you set standards in your marriage, uh, it will help you and your children become stable adults. Very important. You want your kids to be stable? Set the standards alone with your spouse and then explain them to your children and take time to explain all that to you. Set spiritual goals. Not, these are, those, are just, those are just standard goals. You need to set spiritual goals. When you, what, what, what's your time with God? Uh, when, when will you pray with your spouse? When are you going to pray with your, with your kids? Sitting down and saying, these are the goals. This is what I'm going to do. Uh, uh, how often will you be in church? Are you going to be there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night? Are you going to be there every time the doors are open? Uh, or are, are you going to be, when are you going to church? When is it effective? How, how do you plan uh, to affect their spiritual growth? What are you going to do as a husband and wife to bring your children along spiritually? You have to make those decisions. What ministry will you be involved in together? I can't tell you anything that will strengthen a family more than ministering together with your family in, in community events, whatever, that your family sees you ministering with them. I'll say this tomorrow, every one of our children have watched me lead someone to Christ. My children think I'm the greatest soul winner in America. I'm not, but they think I am because they've seen me. My daughter will tell you, my dad can turn any conversation into a soul winning conversation. That's not true, but she thinks it's true because she's seen me do it many times. Uh, your children need to be involved in ministry with you and see that that's an exciting thing. So what ministry are you going to be involved with them together? And then, and then for, for vacations, set vacation goals. We used to always sit with our children and say, what would be a 10 on this vacation for you? Like my son Matthew, he loves any type of ball game. A football, baseball, basketball, volleyball, he'll watch anything or he'll participate in anything. He loves ball games. My son Joshua could care less about any kind of sports. He just doesn't care, but he loves fishing. Now that's not true now because my, my son Joshua married an Alabama fan. And I mean, uh, it's all about Roll Tide. And, and I thought Tide was like something you put in the washing machine. But uh, <laughs> it's all about Roll Tide. And it's all about all this stuff. And Bama fans and all that kind of stuff. Well, he, didn't, he wasn't that way growing up. He liked, he hated sports, but he loved fishing. So we would, on, our, on a trip, uh, we were going on vacation, we'd say, what's a 10 for you? Matt would say, hey, anytime we can go to any kind of ball game, that would be great. Joshua said, anytime... We can go, to, if we're stopping and camping, then I want to go fishing. Uh, the girls would say, where's the closest mall? And uh, outlet malls. When you're driving down the freeway, you see these outlet malls. They want to go in there. And I would be like, a, I'd be very generous and give them each a dollar and uh, tell them to go for it. So uh, anyway, uh, set, set those vacation goals. What are you going to do? What's your, what's your number 10? So and th that's it. And then set your financial goals. Set financial goals with your family. Are you going to tithe? Are you going to give? I, I, I believe you should do all these things, but you need to determine as a family, this is what you're going to do. What about faith promise missions? What about food and clothing? What, what, what are you, what's your budget? What's your goal for those things? Um, what, what kind of home do you want to live in? I have a friend who started off with nothing. He had, he had enough money to put down on a piece of property and he built a house. The guy was a construction um, he was a magician as, as a construction guy, just great, built perfect stuff all the time. And so he decided, I'm going to build a house. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to build that house as a side. I'm gonna, I, he, he worked for a construction outfit. He built a house. He said, I'm going to build this house. I'm going to sell the house. And then we're going to move into an, a, rent, a rental. And then I'm going to take that money and I'm going to buy another piece of property. And I'm going to build a bigger house. And I'm going to do that and I'm going to do that. He did that, was it five times? Four, four times, he flipped it and flipped it and flipped it. Now I watched him do this over a 20 year period. The last house he bought, he, he, the last house he sold uh, was debt free. He sold it for a million dollars and he became a millionaire by planning to do that. And he did it over a period of about 20 years. 
That's it was his plan. And his wife, he let his wife know that that's what they were going to do. So she didn't mind moving from a nice house that they had built. They only got to live in for three or four months, saw it, and then moved down into the cheapest rental house that you could get, and then move into another house and be there for, yes, oh, it's so nice, and then go back to the welfare house, you know, and then, and then, and, but they planned that. They, they planned that. Uh, uh, what's your, set your goals for your future and for your investments. All of those things are goal setting. You do that with your family. You sit down with those, with your family about those things and you talk about those things and your family will be involved in your ministry and it won't be the ministries pulling you away and they'll be involved in what you're doing. And when you're doing things towards a particular goal, they'll understand sacrificing other things in order to, in order to reach the goals that they want to accomplish. So uh, that's my thoughts about balancing uh, your family and your ministry. I, are, are, I would say this, let me say one other thing. In, in the church, do what you can to get your children involved. If you're teaching a class, get, let them teach with you. Let them come into your class. Uh, if, you're, if, you're, if there's a community outreach, I saw yesterday that, that uh, I think her name was Carol, had brought some food and stuff. Is that, what's that? Cheryl. Cheryl. She, she brought food. She, th there was a food bank or something that you they op operated. What a wonderful thing to get your kids to come out and help with that to get your kids involved in whatever you're doing and doing it together. You're rejoicing together. You're seeing things happen together spiritually, physically, emotionally. And those are the things that will bond your family, your children to you when you're doing those things together. Okay, any questions about what I've just talked about? That's it. Now I'm, I am... Do you want to get That's a good question. Here's the deal. What we did bring, growing up is we said there's certain things we're just not going to be able to participate in. There's certain things that other people are doing that we can't do. Like oh, my, my son loved baseball, but he never got to be on Little League. And the reason he didn't get to be on Little League is if he had been in Little League, he'd have missed Wednesday night Awana. And we thought Wednesday night Awana was more important than him being the grand baseball player because that wasn't the plan, plan for the rest of his life. Uh, there were certain things that you just, you have to say no to. Uh, I, think, I think sometimes it's more important to sit at home and watch a movie with your children and people say, and I have, I have people say that you're not interacting with your children, ah, yeah, well, whatever. Uh, I think it's more important to just sit around and have fun with your kids than it is to be involved in everything that everybody else is involved in. Soccer is a big thing in Las Vegas, but our kids weren't involved in soccer because we didn't have the time to do that. And we explained to our children that we, we, ought, we never took away anything. And this is like one of the points that I'll, I might not get to tomorrow, but we called it positive replacement. If we were taking something away that was negative, we always replaced it with something positive. So. Uh, one year, I can remember driving away from Las Vegas at the, uh, in the middle of May. We were going to go on a family vacation. Well, that meant that the kids were going, we had a, a program in our church called Awana, and that we had this big Awana ceremony, and they had been involved in Awana all, all winter long, and there was going to be this great big Awana ceremony, and everybody was going to get awards, but we were going to miss Awana. And they said, oh, we're going to miss the Awana ceremony. And I said, well, okay, listen, we don't have to miss it. We do have reservations at Walt Disney World. 
and uh, we're going to Walt Disney World, and, but I can cancel those because we can stay here for the Iwana ceremony. And they said, let's go to Walt Disney World. <laughs> and uh, so uh, that was a once in a lifetime thing, you know. So, so what we did was we, whenever, we, we let them know that there were certain things we didn't participate in. There was a time our, our children went through homeschool with us and they did a, a Becca homeschool. And, and in, in order to do that and get credit for it, uh, you had to memorize certain amounts of scripture. And there was this big scripture memorization stuff. Well, in Awana, there's, it's huge on Bible memorization, which is wonderful. And that we have it in our church because we want people to participate. But we had to say, uh, but th there was time that uh, they had to either uh, memorize their uh, memorize their Awana verses or memorize their Abeka verses, and they weren't the same verses. And so we said, uh, "You're not going to memorize your Awana verses, but I won't get the prize." Yeah, but you're going to get a graduate. You're going to get a, cert a certificate. You're going to graduate, and and that's more important. There were certain things, and then that's a spiritual thing. I mean, you can't get more spiritual than reading and memorizing scripture, but they couldn't do all of that. And I actually got a teacher mad at me in our own church because I didn't teach our children how important it was to memorize scripture. I didn't have time to explain to her uh, why they were memorizing half of the Bible uh, for homeschool, uh, but they, 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 didn't, they couldn't do, the, do that and the Awana thing at the same time because they have limited intelligence like their father. And so, uh, and so um, uh, we just had to make those decisions. And I think that's so important. You have to decide what is and what isn't important. And you have to help your children decide what is and isn't important. Is it that important that they be at everything that's going on or is it important that they spend time with you? Is it important, what are the things that are most important? And then the things that are driving you nuts, you get rid of. If, if you're exhausted, then you're involved in too much. If, uh, then you just need to drop whatever it is that's exhausting you. And honey, you can't drop me though, because I know I'm exhausting you. But uh, uh, you, you, uh, you have to drop what's exhausting you and focus on those things that are the most important things. And um, those are the things that will draw you close to Christ and draw you close to one another. So I, and, and that's what you have to do in ministry. Here's, here's what I know as a leader in a church. I know that the busiest person is always the person that you can get to do something else. That's the truth, and you know that, preacher. You find somebody that's busy, then you know that, you, and the guy that's not busy at all, it's because he doesn't want to be busy. Uh, and so it's easy to overwork somebody. And, uh, and my wife is very helpful f with me, saying, you've already got that person doing this and this and this, and I think, yeah, yeah. Okay, but I want it done, and, it's, and uh, that's the person that's gonna get it done. And so, um, so you, can, you need to learn to just say no. Nope, I'm not going to do that. No, I can't do that. I'd love to do that. I would want to do that, but I can't do that and get this done and this done and this done. I've told my secretary, you need to tell me if I'm putting too much on you because I will put on, on you as much as I possibly can because I want to get a lot done. And um, so just be honest with yourself and know it's better to do, it's better to do one job really good than do a bunch of bot jobs really bad. And we can handle, we, there's nothing, you don't want to relieve all stress from your life. I heard somebody say, if you relieve all stress from your life, then you'll be in distress, and that's bad. Uh, so what you want to do is balance those things out. And, but there are things you eliminate, and you eliminate them based on principles and Bible priorities. Okay? Hope that helps. Some general statements, yes. Yeah, that's, that's very good. Uh, would anybody have a question you'd like to ask, uh, kind of maybe dealing with that, whether, you know, how to balance anything, family-wise, ministry-wise, life-wise, or anything like that? Anybody? We did not have our kids in, in baseball and volleyball. Here's what happened, though. Let me tell you this. This is really neat. What happened was we started going to, we went to a camp uh, that was starting on the West Coast called the West Branch of the Bill Rice Ranch. And we started getting involved in that. Matthew, who loved athletics, became the athletic director 
for that camp. And so the things that he missed out on early, because he did, wasn't in so the Little League and he wasn't in the volleyball tournaments and he wasn't, he, all of that stuff, he got to do and coach and be part of uh, in the camping ministry during the summer as he was growing up. So God will, if you, if you base your decisions on priorities and principles, God will open doors for those uh, areas uh, for your children later on in the future. So you're saying it's okay to tell your children no? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think we live in a society where, you know, they're telling us you can't tell your children no. Yeah. You know, if kids say, well, I want to do this in order for me to be happy, then parents just have to do it. Yeah. Um, and we're just kind of in a society where children are kind of running everything and what they want to do. I, I think teaching our children that they're servants and not they're, they're, that, that they need to be servants, that they're here to serve, they're not here to be served, is so, so, so important. And, that, and then we teach them to enjoy service rather than endure service. This is what I like to do. I'm here serving tables because I, I like to do that. And uh, took my took my girls to a camp. Uh, we were they were invited to a to a, a uh, couples retreat, and uh, we were going to miss going to an amusement park that year during my daughter's uh, birthday, which we always went to this amusement park every year during her uh, birthday. And uh, so, but we were invited to this couples retreat. I thought it was important to go to the couples retreat. And I said, hey, when we get there, uh, we're gonna, we'll be just having a fun time together. Well, the director called me back and said, hey, uh, we're looking forward to having you come. I said, what do we do with the children? He said, oh, the children can't come. Your children can't come. This is a couples retreat. I said, oh, well, if our children can't come, then we can't come. Because if we don't, if we don't come, if our children can't come, and they said, Oh, well, then I guess we won't be able to do this. And I said, okay. So we hung up. And the next day he called me back and he said, listen, we really want you to come. Uh, if your children come, will they be able to serve? And I said, yeah, they can, of course. Where, where can they serve? And they said, well, we'll put them in the kitchen and we'll let your boys wash dishes and maybe your girls can wait tables or something. I said, that, that's fine. They'll do that. We'll love it. And, and so they came out. Well, my daughters had never waited tables, so my wife dressed them all up really pretty and nice dresses so they looked like fancy little waiters and waitresses and my boys went back in the, with the t-shirts and jeans and washed dishes. <laughs> so when the girls came out it was a couples retreat and there was a, a couple of pastors and their wives that were there. The girls came out and they handed them dishes. They were sitting family style. They handed them dishes and the girls were so cute the wife said give that girl a tip. The preacher's wife. So the one preacher's wife uh, got her husband to give the girl a tip and like she was excited and then the other preacher's wife said you should too and then everybody in the all the, in the whole room were giving her well our kids never had money and they got this money and they, they 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 were thrilled they came up and said dad look at this money and i said give it to me and, uh, and, and so, so they enjoyed they they got to enjoy doing that together so uh, they didn't mind missing out on the amusement park so uh, I just think, again, that's important. You say, this is what we're going to do, and then you teach them to enjoy what they're doing. We used to teach our children that their job was to teach other, other preachers' kids how to enjoy ministry. And uh, I, again, one thing I admire about you is your, your children enjoy ministry, and they're ministering together, so that's a, that's a great thing. If you teach your kids, and I'll talk about this in my second point tomorrow, you teach your kids to have fun, and that Christianity is the greatest, funnest thing in the whole world, then they'll love being in ministry, and they'll love being with you. If you enjoy ministry together with them, they'll enjoy ministry. So. Um, do you mind if I ask a couple other questions? No. Um, one, obviously, um, you talk about living in Las Vegas, starting a church, your children are born and raised there in Las Vegas. Um, Obviously, I don't think Eaton or any place close to here would compare to Las Vegas at all. How did you protect your children in an environment like that, where obviously there's just a lot of wickedness around? Um, again, not obviously around here, it's probably not as bad, but how do parents protect their children from stuff like that when it is when it is out there? Not just 
not just on the cell phones and the internet, things like that, but just out in public and things like that. And how, how did you, in a city like Las Vegas, where it is definitely much more prevalent, I would assume, how did you protect your children uh, and your family in that area? We talked about those things all the time. Uh, you know, the Bible is a pretty graphic book. It talks about everything. Uh, I mean, you've got the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. You have the story of David and Bathsheba. You have the stories. You have, you have God talking about all sorts of terrible things. It's a book that uh, even, the, even Hollywood has taken stories from the Bible and made them into R-rated movies uh, because it's a book that's filled with graphic stories. Well, what's the difference between the Bible then and pornography? Here's the difference. Pornography glorifies that, and the Bible always shows the consequences of, of, of the sin. And that's what you want to do. You want to teach your children the consequences of sin, which is not what the world does. The, the world uh, says, oh, this is glamorous, this is wonderful, this is great. Um, God says, here's what happened with David and Bathsheba, and here's the baby that died because of it and here's the two brothers that killed each other because of it, and here's the sister that was raped because of it, and here's, here's the great consequences of that. See, God's Word talks about all these things, but they're very, very, there's consequences that God says, here's the consequences. You read the story of the polygamy with Jacob and, uh, and his four wives, and then you say, wow, he had four wives. Yeah, and they had really a great family relationship. Uh, Eleven of their brothers, uh, you know, uh, throwing their one brother in the in the pit, and uh, just just wonderful, wonderful interaction. By the way, it's interesting in the story of Jacob and Rachel and Leah that Leah was uh, was uh, Jacob's uh, first wife, and uh, he's. It, it, you say, well, he got fooled into that. Yeah, he did. But who did Judah come from and who did Jesus come from? It came from Leah, not from, not from Rachel, his favorite. Uh, so, uh, so you can teach your children the consequences of sin. And we, I think it's so important that we do that. I, uh, I, had a, I have a brother-in-law, all my brothers, my, my, my brother Ricky was just a, just a terrible person. I mean, I, I love my brother. I think he got saved before he died, but uh, he lived a horrible life. He was into pornography. He was into. Uh, he was married and divorced several times. He he was uh, he deserted his children. He was just terrible. Um, um, uh, so when when I talked to my when I talked to my kids, I would talk to them about Uncle Ricky and all the things that Uncle Ricky did and how would you like to have a life like Uncle Ricky? Nobody wanted to have a life like Uncle Ricky. Uh, Ricky wound up sleeping in missions and, and on the street and uh, it was terrible. So what we did was we talked to our children about those things so that they would see them. When you were, when we actually probably have an advantage over um, uh, being in a nice rural area, area like that we see bad signs and say that's a bad sign, and here's why that's a bad sign. And this is that's that's a bad thing, and this is why it's a bad thing. Um, <laughs> right where the major post office is in Las Vegas, it's right behind a casino called Circus Circus, and uh, and we would have to go down to that made to that uh, main post office to do any kind of bulk mailing. And my wife would take the bulk mail down there, and she'd have Matthew with him. And as we went down there, they there's this great big car, uh, a great big clown outside of Circus Circus and my wife would say that's a bad clown cover your eyes you don't need to look at that clown it's a bad clown because it's it's behind a casino and so so he would cover his eyes and then several years later he said I mean like when as an adult he'd say mom would say cover your eyes and I would peek all the time say what's bad about that clown <laughs> uh, so, but they, they knew the distinction we made the distinction about what was bad and what was good and, uh, and uh, so we always told them and pointed those things out, and we didn't hide these things from our kids. We talked about them, but we uh, told them, again, there are consequences for those things. So, you have another question? Yeah, quick. Um, 
Yeah, one, one other question here. Um, kind of different direction here, but um, what, what advice would you give as far as like Christian singles finding uh, a spouse or something like that? Okay. Um, that are maybe out of, you know, they're graduated young adults about trying to find a spouse or something. Okay. Uh, questions come up about that and, and like internet dating and that kind of stuff and stuff like Christian mingle and that kind of thing. Um, and, and frankly, I don't have a problem with that if you find, if you find, somebody, if you find somebody that's truthful. Uh, you don't, you, you're going to have a problem finding somebody that's, uh, that, that's truthful. What I would do is very simply, and this is going to sound like a pat answer, but I'm telling you, my daughter, my daughter, uh, Charity didn't get married until she was 25, is that right? 24. Uh, and uh, uh, Hope didn't get married until she was 25, and they all went through Bible college and graduated uh, and weren't married. And uh, um, so I think, that I, and I, I tell my daughters, you're just so beautiful that you're intimidating to guys, and that's just the way it is, and that's true. Uh, guys are intimidated by pretty girls. Uh, and so I said, just because these guys are either blind or intimidated, that, that doesn't mean God doesn't have somebody for you. So I would tell them to pray and then make a list of uh, what the qualifications were for, uh, for the, wh what they wanted in a, in a husband, and then just patiently wait on the Lord. And, but pray every day. If you want to be married, pray. Say, God, send me somebody that I want to, want to be married to. There's nothing wrong, and there's nothing super spiritual about saying, well, I'm single, and if this is God's will, then I'll just stay single the rest of my life. Paul did that. That's fine. But there's nothing, that, you don't have to try and be spiritual. You just say, God, I want to be married. I, I would like to be married. And God, I'd like you to send me somebody. There's a girl I've been praying for for, I'd say, at least 20 years. Uh, that lives in the Detroit area that I pray for every day. I pray God give her a godly wife. I, I see her and she says, nope, <laughs> She's, which is, means, nope, I haven't found one yet or someone hasn't found me. But uh, I think there's nothing wrong with saying, God, this is what I want. This is what I want a husband. This is what I want a wife. This is what I want. God, give me that. Uh, if you have a desire to be married, there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with asking God to give to meet that need and then patiently wait on God and trust God. And if there's, if there's a, a singles Christian camp retreat, go to it. Uh, put yourself out there where people are. And uh, my, my, my niece said, you're talking about me like I'm a piece of meat that's going to be out on a meat market. I said, I said, no, I'm, not. I'm just telling you, if I wanted to be married, I'd go where the fish were. If I wanted to find fish, you'd go to a pond and you fish. You don't just sit out in the desert and hope a fish comes your way. <laughs> you know, you go where they are and you find where they are and you pray that God will, that God will give you direction and that you'll find the, the person. And uh, uh, so that's what I would do if I was single and I was looking and I wanted to be married. Um, I would put myself where... Uh, I would find that th there was other people that were interested the way I was. And um, so you don't have to you know, run after somebody, but you can say, Lord, this is what I want. When, when, my, when we were freshmen in Bible college, was it when they were freshmen? Sumner Wimp, my mentor, stood up and said, how many of you girls came to Bible college because you wanted to find a good husband? There were only two girls in the whole, and there was like 2,500 seat auditorium. There were only two girls in the whole auditorium that's, that raised their hand and said, I did. One of them was my wife. <laughs> and she's so glad she found me. And so, uh, so I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think in fact that's, I, that's the best thing I could tell you to do is pray, seek God's face, and put yourself out there where there are other single adults who love the Lord and want to do what's right. So that's, that's what I would do. Anybody have a question or anything? Sure. Yeah, um, we're older, my husband and I, and we have my mother-in-law living with us. And um, it's been very challenging <laughs> because she does go to a group, different place, different denominations. And when we even come to church or do different things, you know, we're always going to church. 
and she didn't, she's been raised Methodist, so it's a different, uh, it's very, been very hard. Okay. And then, you know, I know she's getting older and she's sickly, you know, and she is needing us home more, but we hardly go anywhere except for the church and the grocery store and take her to all these appointments, you know, so it's just. So it's difficult. So the question is, I, we've got uh, a, a mother-in-law that's living in the house, and she's getting older. And uh, what's the responsibility, and how should how should you respond to that? Um, my, my wife and I got married. Both of our mothers were in their 60s, and we knew there was going to come a time that there was going to be uh, that one or, or both of them were going to be living with us because we were, even though the, we're the babies of the family, um, we, uh, we were, we were, God is, was blessing us and we were going to wind up taking care of th them. How, how is that going to work? So we sat down very early in life when we were about 23, 24 years old and said, if they come, if it comes to a point where our moms have to move in with us, what are we going to do? And we decided, the Bible says, if, uh, that a, and I'll cover this tomorrow morning in the Sunday school hour, that, that a man should leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. The most important person in the world is my spouse. And then for us, the most important people in the world, for my wife and I, are our children. So I'm not going to let anybody, whether it's my mom or my whoever, I'm not going to let anybody inf interfere with my relationship with my wife and I'm not going to let anything interfere with my relationship with my children. So we, did, we thought about that and just decided that if it ever came to a point where, our, where either one of our mothers were going to have to move in with us, we were going to build an apartment onto the back of the house and they were going to live in a separate place or we were going to move to a house where we could get a garage and convert it into an apartment where she would have her own entrance into the house and out of the house and she would be taken, uh, she would be able to be right next to us but she wouldn't be part, she wouldn't be in our house. So when the time came, we actually built a mother-in-law's house. In fact, I borrowed $40,000 to do that. And we built onto the back of our house an, an apartment. We took part of our house and, and sectioned it off so that she, they had a bedroom and um, a living room and a dining room and a kitchen area that was theirs. It was their apartment. It was attached. But in order to get into our house, they had to walk outside, go around to the front door, and come into our house. And they were more than welcome to do that, but you had to knock on the door just like anybody else. And that, this, that was their house, and our house, we just were attached to each other. And that kept her from, uh, we, we said it this way, we want you to be able to have your privacy. What I meant was, I wanted you not to interfere with my life. And, and so, because that's what happens, and that's not, it's not good. And so uh, we said that's what we were going to do, and that's what we did. We built on. We, it's interesting because we had two, two godly mothers, two godly women, and we decided they could both stay in the same house together. They almost killed each other uh, because they just, I mean, these were two godly women. I mean, they loved the Lord, but they couldn't get along with each other. You just don't put two or th three women in the, in the same house together. This is not a good deal. So uh, God set the plan, uh, leave your father and mother, cleave unto your wife. And so we just decide, decided that's what we were going to do. And if I was in your situation, that what I would do is I'd figure out a way. If I had to borrow money, I'd say, God bless you, Dave Ramsey. But I am borrowing money to build something on my house so that she can't interfere. And then I would explain to my, because older parents have a tendency to guilt you. Are you going to leave me? Are we, what are you going to do? We took vacations. We did whatever we wanted to. And we said, this is your place. And we told our brothers and sisters, if you come over, um, you can come over. I can remember we were on a cruise to Alaska one, one year. And my sister got very upset with me because my mother was in our apartment. I said, you can go over there anytime you want. You can go over to my to, to, to my house and to, my, to your mother's house. She can come and have her stay at your house. You can do anything you want, but we're not living our life around her. Why? Because my children are more important and my wife is more important than your mother? Yes, than my mother. And, uh, and so, uh, and it worked out okay. I mean, were people mad at me all the time? People are always mad at me. I'm a preacher. So, uh, so yeah, so that...
Yeah, that's, that's what I would do. Okay. It is a challenge. Yes. That's exactly right. And she and and my my we, we there were yes. Yes. It is difficult. It's it's difficult. And 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 what happens is, my mother said to me one time when when she was just starting to move in. She, we had her in the living room with us, and she said, uh, she said, uh, and I had a bowl of tapioca that um, we had made. I don't know how that worked out. I had this bowl of tapioca. Maybe she had made the tapioca. And I went to get the tapioca, and I was going to eat the tapioca, and she said, you cannot eat that. You are not allowed to eat that until you, f you finish your dinner. <laughs> I said, I'm 48 years old. I'll eat whatever I want to, whenever I want to. You know, so mothers never stop being mothers, you know, the, and, and uh, I wasn't going to, I said, okay, that's great. So, uh, so God bless you, mom, but I'm eating the tapioca. In fact, I think I ate the whole bowl just to, just to, yeah, you know, say no authority there. So, yeah, yeah, you just, you have to, you have to be that way. And, 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 and uh, you can't let, can't let false guilt stop you from doing what is right. Your priority is your relationship with your husband and his priority is you and then your children and then you can care for her. You, you don't have to neglect her but you can care for her. I, I tell preachers this all the time that get feeling guilty because they can't reach everybody that you can do what you can do and that's all you can do. That's it. God doesn't expect you to do any more than you can do. You do all you can do but that's all you can do is what you can do. And if if uh, if God wants to miraculously provide something else, then that's fine. But but you just do all you can, and then you leave the consequences and the results to the Lord. Can I do it else real quick? Um, if you listen to podcasts, um, Brother Tice and his daughter do a podcast called Tice Talks. Yes. And uh, it's it's a great uh, it's a great podcast uh, they do together and. Always lots of uh, excitement, funny things going on, but a lot of great questions that are being asked and things like that. So if you ever, if you're a, if you're a podcast listener or if you're interested in listening to podcasts, you want to know what people listen to. Um, I highly recommend um, the Tice Talks. Um, I, I think my wife has listened to every single one. You guys have done. <laughs> I, I can't say that I have listened to every single one, but I've listened. To well, that's one. okay. It's a, it's good to know there's one spiritual person in the family. <laughs> 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 but, uh, but yeah, they do. They're, they're they're really great. Uh, I definitely highly recommend listening to Tice Talks if you listen to podcasts. All right. Well, thank you for being here today. Again, don't forget tomorrow, of course, nine thirty Sunday school. Uh, we'll begin, uh, and that will have uh, all the adults uh, in the auditorium. Uh, and really looking forward to that. And of course, our ten thirty service and six o'clock service as well. All right. Well, let's have a word of prayer. And uh, again, the Tices will be here. Uh, they also have a book table out there, so if there's anything you'd like to get off the book table, uh, you can see them talking a little bit. But let's pray. Father, we thank you.